overview of just how we think about fleet management and what it means to build a modern, scalable device management solution. Marcus is going to talk about Chromebook applications. You know, I think we have a really unique applications platform on Chromebooks where we try to bring the best of a few different worlds together, uh, from the web, obviously, uh, to Chrome uh, extensions and applications, as well as Android apps, and a few other things that Marcus is going to give a preview of. And then Derek will close us out by talking about how uh, SoulCycle has grown its business and its technology together over time uh, and the lessons learned along the way. Like most sessions here at Next, we do have a Dory Q&A available. Uh, so if you'd like to ask any questions, please just go into the app and you can tap on our session and tap on Dory Q&A. Uh, we'll take some questions at the end and we have uh, microphones here as well for live questions. All right, so let's get started. Uh, so one of the things that we really believe in is that uh, organizations need cloud-native tools uh, and endpoints. And we think this because we've talked to many different organizations of all shapes and sizes that are rapidly moving to the cloud. And so their employees' experience now is really centered on apps and devices. We see a Forrester study that showed that uh, employees are now using on average 22 cloud-based apps and three devices. So these are uh, mission critical tools for these employees to do their jobs, and we have a real opportunity to make them better. What we've found though, as we've talked to a lot of organizations, is that managing and scaling and deploying these platforms is actually quite tedious today, uh, and it doesn't scale all that well. And it's not because people are making things overcomplicated. You know, I think when we dig into the processes that organizations are using, all of them make sense. All of them have genuine business reasons behind them. Uh, and nobody is trying to cut out any step of this process. Uh, but I think the important part is that um, it's not very easy and it's not very scalable and we can do a lot better. The other thing is it's only getting harder, right? So whereas at one point maybe you were just taking a device and imaging it and making sure the operating system and the software was up to date and then you just kind of send it out into the field uh, and maybe you see that device again in a few months or a few years. You know, now we're doing everything through the cloud and so we're thinking about not just devices and users but also applications, also peripherals like printers, networks, security, monitoring, reporting, et cetera. And so there are so many new layers to the IT uh, puzzle now that we have to fit, uh, fit together and, and fit together in a way that feels cohesive and that presents uh, uh, an understandable IT policy to our employees. Now, of course, we're adding all of these layers at the same time that we're adding just an unprecedented number of devices into the mix. Uh, so we're making it both more complicated and scaling it in a way that we haven't seen before. Uh, and so I think at Google, we feel that we have the opportunity to help improve the situation uh, by focusing on reshaping uh, enterprise computing. And the reason I say computing is that on the Chrome OS team, you know, we build the Chrome operating system. And when I say cloud native, what I mean is that the Chrome operating system really came out of the Chrome browser project, which is of course people's first sort of introduction to the cloud. That's your viewport into the cloud. Uh, but if you expand the Chrome browser and all of its principles like simplicity uh, and speed and security and you turn that into an operating system, all of a sudden you have a device that's not just uh, cloud ready, not just cloud was added on top of something existing, but actually cloud native, meaning it was built for that purpose. Uh, it was built with the uh, opportunity to do OS updates in a cloud native way, for instance, uh, to do policies in a cloud native way, to do management in a cloud, way to, uh, cloud native way. Um, as well as applications. So in addition to the operating system, the product that we have uh, for realizing this vision of cloud native computing and, and endpoints and tools is the Google Admin Console. Uh, and so if you're using G Suite or you're using mobile device management, this is the same console that you're already accustomed to. Uh, and this is where you can go to manage every single layer that we talked about in that previous slide. Uh, and this is also where you can go to manage your Chrome devices and Chrome browsers. And so when we talk about Chrome Enterprise, that's sort of the umbrella product that encompasses all of these different things. We have fleet management, we've got tools, we've got the uh, application experiences, and all of that together is what allows you to bring Chrome into your enterprise uh, in a cloud native way. So I'm gonna talk real quick about fleet management. 
Uh, and so I'll cover a few principles that we've learned over the years from talking to many different organizations, all shapes and sizes, all industries, verticals, et cetera. The first is that fleet management should be simple. And so what I'd like everybody to picture here is put yourself in the seat of an airplane cockpit. And you're looking around and you see all of these hundreds or thousands of different uh, controls and buttons and uh, surfaces. Uh, and imagine you don't know what most of them do, right? Would you look at one and say, hmm, I wonder what that one does? You know, we hope that people don't fly planes that way, but of course that's how a lot of us learn technology, is we just kind of experiment and see what all of these things do. Um, but hopefully not so much in an enterprise context where these things can have uh, real consequences for our employees. So I want to point out the airplane analogy because I think, you know, you also wouldn't want to fly a plane that didn't have those controls either. So simplicity is not about taking things away, uh, but it's about making sure that you don't actually need to be uh, monitor monitoring and modifying each of those things every time. You know, I think the realization that we had was that we can kind of do things better. We can raise the baseline of what organizations uh, have as their uh, baseline level of security and policy and management, uh, just because there are a lot of commonalities across all types of organizations. Uh, and then you can spend the time customizing things to your exact needs. Of course, simplicity is also only getting harder. Uh, so with a cloud native device, we can now add so many more policies than we've ever had before. And so whereas we started with just a handful of policies, we now have hundreds and hundreds of different ones. This includes things even down to the level of hardware, so things like two-factor authentication, uh, things like TPM firmware updates, uh, 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 things like processor threading. And so I actually hope that nobody in this crowd has ever thought about those things because they're probably not core drivers to what your organization does. Uh, but at the same time, it's helpful to have all of those things, have all of those controls ready. Uh, and that's the type of area where we can make a big impact by making it simple. The other principle that we've heard is that device management needs to be scalable. So with respect to this beautiful animating gear here, that actually means more than just uh, the raw scale of the number of devices you have. Of course, we're familiar with all sorts of scales of devices from just a few to a few hundred thousand. Uh, but scalability also means adapting the fleet management tool to your type of organization. So we work with organizations that have one admin who does things part time every few Fridays because that's what the organization needs. And we work with organizations that have multiple admins with tiers of access different privileges between them, specialized knowledge in uh, devices or networks or security, uh, needs around auditing and compliance and making sure all those processes work well. Uh, and those two organizations don't necessarily need the same management experience. In fact, they probably need different management experiences. And so uh, scalability is not just about making sure that it goes uh, no matter how many devices you have, but that it adapts to the actual needs of your organization. Uh, and lastly, our goal is for device management to be insightful. So uh, we really want to kind of turn the table so that you're not just thinking, I want to manage my devices, but actually my devices can provide something back to me. My devices can provide some kind of information. So imagine that you have a device that is checking in all the time, and then suddenly it just falls off the map. You know, was that because that device got lost or stolen, or maybe the employee is on vacation? Right? It's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that might be worth your time to investigate. Uh, and so insightfulness is about providing that kind of proactive information uh, so that you can pay attention to the right things. Because even at the scale of a few dozen devices, it's just impossible to keep track all the time of every single thing that's happening in your organization. Uh, so we need to have a tool that will actually work with you to help make a lot of that easier. So let's get down to the brass tacks of the things that we're actually working on. The, the first one is speedier administration. Uh, next is OS update controls. You know, we could probably have a whole session just on OS update controls. Uh, we hear a lot from folks that this is really important. And it's also a big opportunity where having a cloud native device allows us to do a lot more things. It's not just about customizing the version, but it's also about how do you uh, scale and deploy and roll out and apply updates. Uh, even OS rollback is something that we've heard a lot about and that we're working on now. 
Uh, so OS update controls are a big uh, area of focus for us. Reporting, obviously, is something we talked about with uh, the point about Insightful. Uh, and then browser management is one I really want to draw your attention to. We just announced on Tuesday the full availability of Chrome browser cloud management. Uh, and so if you're using Chrome browser in your organization, uh, which if I were a betting man, I would say you probably are, uh, this is a way for you to bring Chrome browser into the cloud and actually manage it through the same admin console where you're managing all of your devices. And so you can do things like set policies, deploy apps and extensions, manage extensions by permission if you want to, uh, and even get some information back about what types of extensions your users in your organization are using. Um, so if you're not yet on fully cloud-native devices, uh, we understand that that takes some time, but browser management is a great way to get started today uh, with having some of the magic of the cloud management in your organization. Uh, so I'm gonna go through a couple of real quick demos here. One thing I wanna point out is that if you are familiar with our Google Admin Console, you'll notice that these look a little bit different. Uh, and that's because we're working on a full uh, visual refresh and uh, adding a few new features and making it a lot faster. So this stuff may look a little bit new, that's intentional. Uh, and we have a, a number of uh, trusted tester and beta programs if you're interested in trying it out. So for the first quick demo, we're gonna do a device search and disable. Uh, so imagine that you have a uh, fictional organization and we've got an employee named Sandra and she's leaving the organization. So what we can do is just go ahead and search for Sandra's name uh, and we're gonna find all of her devices in the device list. She has 15 of them, so she must have been productive. Uh, we're gonna just go ahead and disable them. Uh, and what you might catch at the end there is that we're actually putting a message on the device itself that says, you know, property of organization, please return to this address, that kind of thing. Uh, and so this is a great example where having a cloud-native tool uh, and a cloud-native device really work together well uh, because we have this just built into every single Chromebook that you're managing. Uh, and when you think about things like information security uh, and data lockdown and whatnot, uh, this is a really, really easy and integrated way to do all of that stuff. You don't need third-party software. Uh, you don't need to buy anything else. It's just part of the Chrome Enterprise product. Next is log capture. Uh, so we understand sometimes people need to capture logs about their devices for any reason. Uh, and with Chrome Kiosk devices, you can do just that. So I'm gonna go ahead and capture logs here. This is actually gonna run in the background, so if you wanna go uh, to somewhere else in the admin console and do another thing while it's running, you can do that. Uh, of course, once it's done, you can go ahead and just download the file. So we'll give you a zip file with a bunch of different logs from the device. We can open up the event log in a text editor, find anything we need. And again, this is not the only uh, log capture system out there, but it shows the power of having things that are really fully integrated, having a cloud-native device with the cloud-native management uh, working together really well. Uh, the last thing I'll mention about fleet management is again that we are running trusted tester programs on these things all the time. And so if you like anything you're seeing so far, uh, or you'd like to try them out and give us some feedback, we'd love to have you do that. Uh, please just come see us uh, right outside the door after this and we'll be happy to uh, take it out, down your information and get you set up with that. Uh, I also wanna mention if you're using the trusted tester program and you send feedback to us and you're wondering where that feedback goes, it goes to my inbox. Uh, so we are really truly reading every single word that you send us. Uh, we care a lot about building a, a tool that is, is actually simple and scalable and insightful uh, and we can only do that with your help. So thank you very much for that. Next, I'm gonna invite Marcus up onto the stage to talk about application management. So thanks, Max, for that great first overview of the admin console, and also thanks for everybody in the audience for having me, uh, especially after the big event yesterday evening. So I'm Marcus, and I will give a short overview of the um, Chrome OS app ecosystem in the next minutes, and thereby especially focus on the question, how can we manage these apps? Um, basically, the Chrome OS app ecosystem is driven by one core idea that's very inherent to Google. We want the open web to succeed. So imagine a, a world where basically all your apps are in the cloud. So all the apps you are using for your business or your entertainment are web apps. In this world, you could basically walk everywhere, use every device, log into your favorite web app, and you are done. You could just be productive or entertained wherever you like. 
And with being driven by this idea, we have basically these advanced technologies of Chrome OS in the center of our app ecosystem. However, we are well aware that basically um, in AdWords of today, it is, it is not possible to realize every application as a web application because not every um, system capability is actually available as a web capability. So that's the reason why we have these native apps on the left side, namely Chrome apps and Android apps. Um, I, I'm sure some of you know that Chrome apps are already deprecated on Windows and Mac and that we invest more and more um, basically into the integration of Android apps into the Chrome OS operating system. However, both of these native apps have the, the advantages that you basically can use all system capabilities on a Chrome OS device. And on the right side, you see the Linux apps here. So we are well aware that not every developer and not every user of a Chrome OS device will use Linux apps. So basically Linux apps are a great way to support developers on Chrome OS devices. So to conclude, with Chrome OS, we don't want to build another gated ecosystem, but we want the webs to succeed, and we do this by native apps, advanced web technologies, and Linux apps on our devices. I want to walk through these three pillars now step by step, and especially start with the Android apps here. So when I was at the booth the last two days, basically a lot of people were coming and talking to me, and they were surprised that actually Android apps are running on a Chrome OS device. So yes, it's possible. You can basically just go into the Play Store on a Chrome OS device and install um, nearly every um, Android app you like. There are some restrictions. Some of them require a camera at the back of your device, so these ones don't work, but nearly every, everything works, basically. And uh, if you look at, basically, the app ecosystem that enables this for you, um, you can, for example, use every communication app you like. So if you don't like Hangouts for whatever reason, you can, for example, use uh, uh, Cisco Jabber on these devices, you can use Cisco WebEx, you can use Skype, um, basically to connect to your colleagues. You can also use, for example, various system close and networking apps like VPN apps to, to log in basically into the corporate network of your uh, company. Um, for example, the ones of our colleagues at F5. And you can also use uh, VDI apps so, for example, you can use Citrix, VMware, Microsoft RDP. All these apps are basically part of the Play Store as of today. And with these VDI apps, you can use, for example, applications that are very computation intensive. So if you want to, for example, design 3D things on your device, like using a CATIA software, it probably doesn't make sense to uh, carry this big notebook that is needed to execute CATIA all the time around with you. You can just run this in the cloud and stream it via VDI to your device. And actually, the cool thing is that for all these Android apps, they are coming out of the Play Store. That means that basically the Play Store already filters for harmful apps, which helps to increase the security of your device. And as an admin, you can even go one step further and whitelist specific apps for your users. So basically, you prepare a set of apps that your users should install. And you can even go one step further and say, okay, I want to install this and this app by default for certain users. So that's called force install in our um, admin console. And this allows basically the user to use these apps at the moment where he logs in into his Chromebooks. These apps are installed instantly, and he can use them just by default. We'll see this later on. Okay, but let's move to the core, what is basically the web apps here. Um, can we do everything with web apps as of today? No. If you walk around and you see basically Gmail, Google Drive, G Suite, you can have the impression that it's already possible, but the true answer is actually it's not possible as of today um, because some capabilities are still missing. And to basically close the gap between today's web apps and uh, the native apps that we have on the system as of today, we have three clear initiatives that are described on this slide. Um, for example, we have one initiative that has the target to basically provide all APIs and capabilities to support applications in the web. So this includes, for example, system um, notifications. Basically, every app should be possible to raise system notifications. Every app should be able to create sockets or an app should be able to access the file system. So we are adding these capabilities step by step, um, not only on Chrome OS, but in general with the Chrome browser and a lot of platforms out there. 
Um, the second step is that we have progressive uh, web apps, especially uh, desktop progressive web apps, which allow to install apps offline, web apps offline on any device that you like. And the third step is that you can basically use WebAssembly to execute your C++ code, um, which helps on the one hand to migrate apps from one platform to another, but on the other hand um, speeds up WebAssembly web a lot. So we have the example of Figma here. So Figma is quite a nice app basically to design Android apps and you can run it completely in the browser. It's using WebAssembly based on C++. If you want to know more about these progressive web app technologies, I invite you to visit the session later on today from my colleague Thomas, MD203, um, developing uh, on Chrome, and it's uh, at 11.40. And uh, last but not least, we have Linux running on Chrome OS. So as I said, it's targeted as for, for developers. Um, we have a Debian. Uh, running there where you can basically execute your Linux apps um, and they are quite sandboxed from the other apps on the Chrome OS device. And um, favorable setup that we have running here where we see a lot of traction is for example that you run Android Studio on a Chrome OS device and then you can basically test the uh, developed Android apps also directly on this device. And that's actually well used. However, um, to be honest, like the Linux integration, so Crostini is still at an early stage. So it runs on uh, nearly off all of the Intel-based Chromebooks. However, the admin console management here at the moment is at a stage where you can only turn it off or on. So we are planning to add these capabilities later on this year. To conclude the app section, um, I want to highlight that basically all of the apps are kept separated via sandboxing. So you know this probably very well from your Chrome browser. Um, so if one tab crashes, not the whole browser's crash, but only this tab is basically uh, shut down. And uh, basically every tab is isolated from the other tabs in your browser. The same holds true for the web apps, for uh, Chrome extensions, for Chrome apps and Android apps on your Chrome OS device. Let's now move on basically to the management. And if you look at management, we basically have three um, main ways to manage Chrome OS apps. And uh, let's start with the first one. This is basically um, you allow the user to do what you like. So basically you trust the user to execute apps. You don't influence it a lot. And uh, this setup is probably very favorable if you have like administrators in your user base um, who you don't want to restrict a lot because you, you think, okay, they, they know what they do. Um, I, grant them all permissions. Second way to manage apps is via blacklisting and whitelisting. So blacklisting and whitelisting works quite nicely for web apps. It works for Chrome ex apps, extensions, and also um, Android apps. So the idea is that you either like exclude specific apps from being installed on the user's devices, or you whitelist them. So you basically say, okay, the user has the right to install this or this, that app. And uh, therefore, you can basically create a fairly good set of apps and basically restrict the user to what he can do on this device. And third step, I already mentioned it, is to force install apps on the device. So you can basically say this app should run on the user, user's device um, every time he logs in. Evidently, you can like combine these, like you can whitelist certain apps and force install other apps. And uh, what's actually pretty cool and what I like about the admin console here is that basically um, the admin console has quite smart defaults. So for example, if you are an enterprise and you start the admin console with its defaults, you will see that Android is activated by default with all apps available to the users. So basically, um, if you do, don't do anything, users are in the position to decide which Android apps they want to install, which makes quite a lot of sense if you look at an enterprise user. However, if you are like a school, so you have basically an education license, the default setting for schools is that Android is first shut down, and even if you activate it, it's um, activated in a managed mode, which means that you basically whitelist the apps that are available for the students. And the reasoning behind this is quite clear. Um, we don't want to play students' games during the lessons um, because nobody would listen to the teacher any longer. Um, so basically, the admin console helps you quite a lot to have the right defaults here and not to do the wrong thing um, by any chance. Okay, let's maybe have a look at some examples here um, that we brought from the admin console. So the first one is the integrated app list. 
So all the apps that you have in Android uh, on, uh, on Chrome OS are basically listed in this integrated app list. So you have the Chrome apps, Chrome extensions, and Android apps in this list. And you can easily see what apps are installed on your device, and you can easily search for them. So we will see that we basically filter first for all Android apps, and then we look for the Google Drive app in this example. So we go into this list. Um, we click on type, click on Android, and then we have the Android list apps, or if you just type drive there, you see basically the drive apps that are available for your user base. And the second example actually um, is this one. So here we basically want to add a new play app on the user's devices, and we don't want to just add it, we want to force it solid and pin it. Pinning means that basically the icon is shown at the um, lower bar on the user's devices so that he can easily access it. And if you want to do that basically, you go to the same list, you click on the plus button down there, then you go to the Play Store, and then you search for, search for the Sheets apps inside um, this Play Store, click on it, and click Select. And from this time on, you will have the, play, uh, the Sheets app in your app list. And now you can basically select what you want to do it. You can allow install it, but you can also force install it, block it, pin it, or force install it and pin it, and that's what we do here. All right. This already concludes my part, and now I want to hand over to Derek, um, who gives us basically, yeah, a true use case, yeah, explains this example, um, and uh, yeah, that's quite very well, I guess. Thank you, morning, everyone. Good to see you all so bright and early on uh, Thursday morning. Thanks, Max and Marcus and Google for having me here today. Uh, so. Like uh, all the stuff that you saw uh, in the slides previous, I'm really excited to talk to you about how SoulCycle used basically a lot of the technology that you saw in transforming uh, all of our studios to Pixelbooks. I want to give you a little bit of history first. So, SoulCycle opened in 2006. We had one studio, 30 bikes. And in the 13 years that we've been open, we've now, uh, we're now at 92 studios. During times of rapid growth, that could mean 12 to 14 studios per year. And uh, super excited to say that we'll be opening our first studio in London in, I want to say, June. Each studio has seven to eight classes per day, and uh, that makes about 600 rides. I'll leave you guys to do some napkin math on what that looks like. And then, to make all that work, uh, from a tech side, we're looking at 2,500 staff across the United States and Canada, um, and 500 computers across the fleet. So when we started to look at replacing our existing technology for new technology, we came up with a few rules and a challenge. We wanted our new technology to prepare for innovation in the future. So basically, that means for point of sale, running transactions day to day, for retail transactions, and also whatever is in that looking glass of, of, of technology. We also wanted to be able to allow our studio staff um, to interact with our riders in a, in a new way. So uh, for any of you that have ridden a Soul Cycle before, we've got a front desk with our studio staff behind it, and we wanted to be able to look at what technologies could we use that we could send uh, our studio staff into new areas of our studio and start to look at uh, different types of interaction with our riders. This is the interesting one. What we wanted to do um, was to try and find a single tool that looks after the management of our hardware, of our applications, our users, without a lot of like the traditional glue that comes with running an enterprise suite of hardware and, uh, and users. Specifically, we want to look at modern identity platform um, security features like two-factor authentication. We wanted to look at an easy way for application administration and also to tie that in together with a single hardware management platform. And of course, we had a good mix of aging computers out there, so we decided how do we can replace that in a quick and simple way that uh, doesn't end up with a mix of hardware in our studios over time. 
thankfully, we've been PCI compliant for several years now. And in choosing our hardware, and uh, our, we wanted to be able to make sure that we could maintain our PCI compliance, but also to see if we could reduce what our footprint would look like over time. As with any challenge, comes a couple of rules. One, each studio must be upgraded within two to three hours. We have a nice little gap in between our morning classes and our evening classes. We wanted to make sure that we could rip out the old technology, get new technology in there, but more importantly, prepare the studio staff for that new tech, so that when the next ride check-in comes along, um, they already feel comfortable with the operations that they need, they already feel comfortable with what a device may look like, both from logging into the device, using our software, um, and primarily focusing on the, the ride interaction as opposed to how do I use this thing. This is probably the most important part. Making sure that our studio staff feel good about what they're about to do. Changing technology can be really, really intimidating for people that don't live with it every day. This was one of the things that I thought about the most. OK. Taking all of the, the challenge and the rules into consideration, we started to look around at a mixture of tablets, laptops, devices. Do we look at replacing our existing technology with the best in breed in, in the, that, that line? Be, we've been a G, Gmail customer since, I want to say, 2006. I wasn't there. Um, we decided that the best, uh, the best move forward was to leverage what we are already use, what our users are already using with Gmail. We've got, we decided to look for um, Chrome Enterprise and for deploying pixel books at all of our studios. With Chrome Enterprise, as you saw in the previous slides, we're able to take a lot of the organizational units and the policies that we could associate with those organizational units to identify applications, to associate applications to those specific users so that we could tailor their um, environment or their desktop to precisely what they needed to do to do their job the best. With Pixelbooks, um, we decided to go for Pixelbooks because of ultimately their form factor and their aesthetic. I don't know if you, for those who have Pixel Books right now, they're pretty slick looking devices, but in, also they, uh, you can use them in laptop mode, tablet mode, uh, and I'll show an example later of how we're using them in all their different forms. In moving to Chrome Enterprise and for Pixel Books in all of our studios, we decided to also move a lot of our traditional file servers over to Google Drive and Team Drive. This meant that we would be able to um, unify, we'd be able to get some of our enterprise uh, users that were on more traditional devices and uh, increase the, the collaborative function of productivity of, uh, of uh, Google Sheets Google and Notes and Docs um, and share that with our studio staff. For printing, this was an interesting solve. So uh, we decided to go for, uh, we looked at some hardware-based devices that basically use Google Cloud Print, um, which was pretty good. Um, we ended up using a mixture of Google Cloud Print devices, Google Cloud Print printers, um, but also uh, there's a the Windows Cloud Connector that we, all, that we, ran, on, uh, we ran on our traditional print servers. Thankfully, we were able to maintain our PCI compliance. Pretty stressful thing to actually get done. But um, what I wanted to share with you is just a couple of things that made that happen for us. Trusted apps via the Play Store. With trusted apps, we were able to um, essentially prove the integrity of those applications. Um, with Google Asset Management, 
Auditors like to know that you know where your stuff is. So, so a lot of the reporting tools that we're able to use um, helped in our, in our compliance filing there. G Suite IDP, um, using two-factor authentication for, uh, as part of the user security, uh, our, our orders is also really liked. And uh, a couple of other things. So uh, if any of you had to deal with PCI compliance before for your internal security scans, uh, where they're footprinting the devices themselves and doing uh, security scans, very nice to know that there were not many open ports on a pixel book. Um, unlike a traditional computer where there's usually a fairly a myriad of open ports. Once we put all that together, uh, we sent our, our guys on a studio tour. So we have a fairly small lean team, uh, broke them out into smaller, uh, into regions. So we took California, uh, Central, East Coast. We were able to send one, uh, one person to each studio and easily go through the upgrade from our traditional compute to Pixelbooks. This is our Las Vegas studio. I just want to walk you through what you're seeing right here. So on the, this is our front desk here where we've got Pixelbooks that we use for point of sale and for our booking. And then you'll see on the right hand side, this is, this is a pixel books running in tablet mode um, that we use for our digital signature rider waiver application. So when a uh, rider enters the studio, if they're brand new, um, we can get them checked in at the front and then they can just walk around the side and then go sign their digital waiver and go and ride. But also because of the way that Pixelbook, the, the, now that we're looking at Pixelbooks in their different iterations, we can send them out to the front of the studio, run retail, you know, kind of use them for any kind of application that we see fit. There's a few things we learned from all of this that I wanted to share with you. Listen to your users. I think everybody, when you're looking at replacing new tech, or putting in new tech, you, you think you know what your users need. We spend a lot of time sitting with, our, with people in our corporate office and in our studios, asking them questions about what their workflows look like. What are they doing from day to day? What problems do they have with what they have, what they have right now? And how do we go about fixing those? In finding those solves, be creative. Sometimes, uh, I, I mean, I've been, in, I, I've been working in tech now for 20 years. Sometimes there's an expectation on how to go about doing something, right? I need this application that does that. I can fix this by doing that. This is an opportunity, or what I learned was, let's rethink it again uh, from, and looking at some of the slides from earlier on, things like, is there uh, an Android app that could actually solve this problem a little better? Do I look at reaching out, do I look at replacing this app entirely with a web app? All of those things. And lastly, reach out to Google, talk to your reps. I don't think that we would have been anywhere near as successful or have been as quick as we could have been had we not spoken to all of our reps about how do I make team drive work with Pixelbooks? How do I make, how do I do this thing with a policy that makes that thing work? I would have scratched my head for an awful lot longer had I not been for the help of Google. And uh, I want to hand it back to Max and Marcus for Q&A. Thank you so much.